To United Unitarian Universalist Congregation. My name is Reverend David Kramer, minister at this church. Helping with this service today are Alex Chilson, our music director, and Dennis Reynolds, our director of religious education. You can tune into this service throughout the week at our website, unituuc.org. Today we have a special guest. Reverend Denise Cauley will deliver the message, Live Like Moss, which invites us to live in harmony with every ecosystem on the planet. A tall order, especially for us Americans, and never more important. Denise has been serving Bradford Unitarian Universalist Community Church in Kenosha for the last two years as an intern on her path into ministry. She also has worked as a chaplain at Planned Parenthood of Wisconsin. Her work there has been personally inspiring. Her deep humanity in that fraught liminal space has been invaluable, I know, for Planned Parenthood staff, and I am sure also for many, many women. Denise says she loves walking by big bodies of water, which is fortunate as she lives in Milwaukee, where Lake Michigan is near. She also is a wonderful artist. She has provided the artwork on the front of the Order of Service today, and we will view more of it a little later in the service. She also is an activist in diversity, inclusion, marriage equality, and voting rights. Today is an extra special day for Denise. In Kenosha, this afternoon, she will be ordained by that congregation. I hope that you will all join me in extending a really happy congratulations. And welcome to United, Denise. In Milwaukee, I treasure walking and praying near Lake Michigan. I enjoy taking pictures and drawing from nature as I make my painted prayers. You'll see a few images of my painted prayers today during service. Today, I'm gonna share a message with you of harmony. I'm gonna quote one of my favorite authors, religious naturalist, scientist, Robin Wall Kimmerer. She's not just an ecologist, but also applies indigenous ecological knowledge in conservation. Dr. Kimmerer is a member of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation. She has a love of moss that reminds me of the harmony theme, especially when she shares, in our indigenous way of knowing, it is understood that each being has a particular role to play. Each and every being is endowed with certain gifts, its own intelligence, its own spirit, and its own story. Our stories tell us that the Creator gave these to us as original instructions. The foundation of education is to discover that gift within us and use it well together. Good morning. Please join me in lighting our chalice with the words on your screen. May this flame kindle within us the warmth of compassion the glow of love, 
the fire of commitment, and the light of truth. Here together, we scatter and nurture seeds of spirit, service, and community. Please join me in singing hymn number 346, Come Sing a Song with Me. The other seeds, they look at me and they say, that seed is so bad. When they think I'm not listening, they mumble, there goes a bad seed. But I can hear them. I have good hearing for a seed. How bad am I? You really want to know? Well, I never put things back where they belong. I'm late to everything. I tell long jokes with no punchline. I never wash my hands or my feet. I lie about pointless stuff. I cut in line every time. I stare at everybody. I glare at everybody. I finish everybody's sentences, and I never listen. And I do lots of other bad things, too. Know why? Because I'm a bad seed. A bad seed. I wasn't always this bad. I was born a humble seed on a simple sunflower in an unremarkable field. 
I had a big family, seeds everywhere. We found ways of having fun. We were close. But then the petals dropped. And our flower drooped. It's kind of a blur. I remember a bag. Everything went dark. And then, and then... A giant? I thought I was a goner. I thought I was done for. I screamed and I hollered. But I was spit out at the last possible second. I flew through the air and I landed under the bleachers with a huge thud. When I woke up, it was dark outside. A wad of gum had softened my fall. I felt okay, but something had changed in me. I'd become a different seed entirely. I'd become a bad seed. A bad seed. That's right. I stopped smiling. I kept to myself. I drifted. I was a friend to nobody and bad to everybody. I was lost on purpose. I lived inside a soda can. I didn't care. It suited me. Until recently, I have made a big decision. I've decided that I don't want to be a bad seed anymore. I'm ready to be happy. It's hard to be good when you're so used to being bad. But I'm trying. I'm taking it day by day. Sure. I still forget to listen. And I still show up late. And I still talk during movies, and I do all kinds of other bad stuff. But I also say thank you. But I say please. And I smile. And I hold doors open for people. At least, sometimes. And even though I still feel bad sometimes, I also feel kind of good. It's sort of a mix. All I can do is keep trying and keep thinking, maybe I'm not such a bad seed after all. Hey, look! Hey, look! There goes that bad seed. Actually, he's not that bad anymore. I heard that. Please join me in singing number 1067 in the teal hymnal, Mother Earth, Beloved Garden. Stephen Schick. Spirit of love, spirit of life, who are we to know how you moved over the waters when all was new? We were not there when you parted them and formed dry land. We didn't hear you cry with joy when the earth gave birth to life or when love began to grow in the human heart. Your longing for hope created this vast diversity of beings whom we now share our days. 
spirit of perpetual creation and recreation, help us to see past our pride to what we have done, to help us accept responsibility for destroying the gifts of clean water and air, of woodlands and grasslands, of creatures that fly through the air and swim through the seas and walk, creep, and crawl on dry land. Help us to gather seeds of humility and join you, join all of us together in renewing this earth. Amen. May it be so. Each week we celebrate joys and sorrows in this church, milestones in our individual lives. Today, Rick Leffler is celebrating his 70th birthday. Congratulations, Rick, and happy birthday. Barb Johnson, who has been on hospice since returning home from the hospital at the end of March, has now been released from hospice. This is really great news. It means that Barb is on the mend and we are so glad. Edna Pfeiffer has moved into a new apartment at the Avalon and continues to unpack. She is experiencing some back pain and is undergoing physical therapy to help this. And today, I would like to lift up these people who are part of this caring community. Erica Winkler and Tessa and Evan and Harvey and Heidi Wolk. Let's hold all of these in our hearts and minds and join in, if you can, as Alex leads us in singing Walking With You. week we take up an offering, which is a sign of our generosity and a part of what it takes to sustain this ministry. If you choose to give by text or online, please indicate whether you wish your gift to go toward the plate or toward your pledge. And if you do pledge, please continue giving by check or better yet by automatic bank transfer as these methods help save us some expense. We appreciate all your gifts. Today for our meditation, please take a big deep breath. Put yourself in a comfortable position. And as you meditate on these images that I drew and photographed, think about how cherished spring and summer will be this year. This poem is by Susan Fear, a poet from the University of Wisconsin. It's called Peonies. 
The young girls walk by looking like wedding cakes, Art Nouveau vases. They are wearing only peonies. Exhausted from wearing beauty, they night hurry home to pull the flowers over their heads. They learn that once you wear a dress of peonies, your skin is forever fragranced with the flower's operatic sweet sadness. All over the early June city, collapsed dresses of peonies still as rugs incense bedrooms. Wild canaries fly from the dresses peony scented puddles and sing about the sleeping girls. Have you heard the peonies glossiola? Have you ever watched a black swallowtail's gold and sky blue pierced wings rearranged by 44 mile per hour winds while it holds to a festiva maxima blush peony, all while maintaining all its delicate migrating strength? Have you seen your neighbor, white nightgown, stop the morning of her death to bring greedily to her face one last time the fragrance of her greatly loved white lejeures? Looking at the sleeping newborn in its white bassinet, one would never believe, even if told in great detail, what would happen to that infant during its life. Or, if one did believe, one might go mad with fast-forwarded beauty, boredom, and terror. Looking at the tight, small gumball bud, it is difficult to imagine the coming unfurling, the coming foliage, the slow opening beauty, the insane fragrance. I watch the drunk, crazy ants come like explorers to travel the tight white and green globes, the holy trinity leaved peony buds. All over the city, around paint chipped garages, around perfectly painted garages, separating lot lines, tied to dooryard black iron railings, on pillowcases and beds, holding up houses in vases surrounding baths, in the convent's oddly upright and mangled bushes, under bird bath heavy collapsed bunches, in vacant lots, and reflecting in witching balls, peonies bow with fragrance, and all such burdens of beauty. It is not hard to understand why my immigrant grandmothers, both the tall, elegant French one and the sweet, doughy Czechoslovakian one, prize their limonges and cut glass dishes and peonies equally. Why they carry to their American homes the promise heavy flowers. Why they opened their soil around their new homes and planted all the sweet possible peonies they could find sun for. Nor why, when my mother married and moved to the new wilderness of the suburbs, she carried the newspaper-wrapped dream peonies with her and I. Second generation on each family side have double-planted flowering long fetal peonies and Mrs. Franklin D. Roosevelt peonies and avalanche peonies all along my front steps, just so that you June visiting might breathe in all the flowers information. Longevity and mad medicinal genius. My neighbor planted her entire front yard in peonies. In June, I am disabled with the wild sweet smell I cannot sleep breathing in peonies fragrance. It is easy to understand why people wallpaper their bedrooms with peonies, perfectly preserve them under glass bells, try to replicate their smell in perfumes and house sprays, 
and sleep under peony decorated comforters. No dreams are as wonderful as dreams after breathing Queen of Hamburg peonies. After I've breathed in nights of truth drug flowers, ask me and I will tell you about women's body memories, about the slow, moist opening of peonies, the ruffled silk slippery dark red petals, the ant-licked open peonies, the wealthy smell of nights of peonies that dream and swell grow from tightness to wild, reckless, loud, unfurled, dropping petals. Have you ever rubbed a peony petal between your thumb and index finger? It's smoother than magnolia, tongue sweeter than yellow cake, better than any Chinese potion. Put a peony in your hair, you will not be disappointed with the suggestions whispered in your ear. Be in harmony, like moss. I love moss. I delight in examining the many textures and colors of moss. I actually get down on the ground and sniff and look at the moss fibers and the threads and I often notice they are as varied as the forest. I stare long enough to imagine that I am in a fairy land where I am tiny and I can live like the moss. I envision myself sitting in a moss bed, sipping coffee and eating chocolate chip cookies. Moss carpets have long been a place I contemplated napping especially when I was a little girl. I love when my foot goes into their endless squishiness of moss. Moss like another land and yet it has so much to teach us. I don't know about you but when I think of how we are treating the earth I get depressed. I have read dozens of articles that paint a grim picture of how the United States uses more water, more energy, and more of the Earth's resources per capita, per person, than almost anywhere else on Earth. Not even just a little bit more, but hundreds of times more than most people on the planet. America's oil, coal, and natural gas consumption is the most per person of any country using 21% of the world's energy. The whole world's energy we use 21% of. Obama signed the Paris Agreement in an effort to leave office with a plan to address climate change. But Donald Trump's decision to abandon the agreement, signed by 195 other nations, has increased the U.S.'s production and consumption. Seeing the recent shutdown due to coronavirus of so many states and watching the world's carbon footprint improve and decrease showed me that there are ways of doing things differently, but that it requires us acting in community collectively, and in harmony with nature. Considering this rampant consumption and human infestation into every corner of livable earth, I look to the similarities and juxtaposing characteristics of moss. Like humans, moss inhabits nearly every ecosystem on earth and mosses have the ability to clone themselves. Clone themselves from broken off leaves or tattered fragments. Unlike humans, moss is integral to the functioning of a forest. Humans are not integral to the functioning of this planet. Now most of you watching this sermon are in Florida, and I want to point out that what is called Spanish moss is not a moss, but actually a perennial herb that's part of the pineapple family. 
What I'm talking about today is, is moss that forms from spores carried in the wind and in currents of moving water. Moss makes its own food through photosynthesis. Mosses do not form where other healthy plants grow, but in areas that need the environment readied for healthy growth. They usually appear in places of dis-ease and unhealth. They act like sponges and prevent soil erosion. We maintain our American lifestyle at the expense of the rest of the planet. This is the height of Arvis. Our current lifestyle demands that we perceive our existence as more important than almost everyone else in the entire world. Contrast that to moss, which survives by living in harmony with every ecosystem on the planet. Unitarian Universalist Reverend Fred Small, co-chair of the Religious Witness for the Earth, a national interfaith network dedicated to public witness on environmental issues, especially global climate change, writes, Poor people and people of color are the first victims of environmental poisons and natural disasters. Disparities of wealth and status lead to waste and pollution by both affluent and the depraved. We simply cannot solve the problems of ecology without facing the problems of inequity, not vice versa. Throughout the world, poor and working people, especially people of color, are pollution's first victims. The air, water, soil, and shelter are more contaminated. They toil in more hazardous workplaces, and they are more vulnerable to environmental catastrophes if they are people of color. Invasive developments threatens the health, the religious traditions, the so social fabric of indigenous peoples. So rather than assuming that wealthy white America's ideas of sustainability are superior, I wondered what I would learn if we look to Native people and to those most impacted by the dominant culture's consumption. I considered Robin Wall Kimmerer's writings about moss in her studies as a botanist and bryologist, a person who studies moss, as she is a member of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation. Kimmerer states, science asks us to learn about organisms. Traditional indigenous knowledge asks us to learn from them. And when I think about mosses in particular, as the most ancient of land plants, they have been here for a very long time, she says. They've figured out a lot about how to live well on the earth, and for me, I think they're really good storytellers in the way that they live. An example of what I mean is by this in their simplicity, in the power of being small. Mosses become so successful all over the world because they live in these tiny little layers of rocks on logs and in trees. They work with the natural forces that lie over every little surface of the world. And to me, they are exemplars not only of surviving, but flourishing by working with natural processes. Mosses are superb teachers about living within your means. How can we be more like moss in our approach to the environment? Consider how recycling is not simply putting an object in the correct container, nor is it about passing a law to make recycling required. Any effort we undertake to improve our planet has to be done in concert, in harmony with the entire planet. Sadly, the United States made laws about recycling without ever building the kinds of processing facilities needed to actually recycle our own goods. We have been putting our plastic bottles and goods and cardboard on ships and sending those 
to China to be processed there. Now the Chinese are re rejecting almost all of our recyclables, more so since coronavirus happened. Nothing is going there to be recycled. And they're now sending everything back to us and we are burning most of them in our incinerators that do not have the proper filters and are putting toxic fumes into our atmosphere. Most of these incinerators are located in neighborhoods inhabited by poor people and people of color. It is easy, it's so easy to be disheartened about this. I know I am. It is difficult to think you alone can make a difference. I would argue that you alone cannot make a difference. Instead, you have to be more in community, more cooperatively living in harmony, just like Moss. Moss does all of its work by cooperating within the species, within the place that it lives. Isn't that how we create hope? We work together. Growing up, I was taught all of nature was dependent upon ruthless survival of the fittest. I now realize that's just not true. Indeed, for us to address everything from what we consume to where it goes, we must look at the problems we created cooperatively, like how moss operates. Moss is the oldest living species, and rather than depending upon competition to survive, mosses live through cooperation. If humans, especially Americans, are the hostile alpha organisms devastating this planet as we knew it, as we know it, then more than 22,000 kinds of moss at over 20,000 years old they are the collaborative peacemakers. Not only are moss scientifically impressive beyond measure, but following their example is the only way to sustain our existence. To sustain our existence, moss is the answer. Moss can guide us in our hope for the future. Moss exemplifies the three C's of environmental hope. Collaboration, cooperation, cooperative harmony, and community building. A congregation who aims to create a faith, a just faith, one that we are called to, to continually refine how we live and how we treat others, and how we address problems, we are called to look far beyond the recycling bin, farther than our household consumption, to across the oceans where we ship our garbage and then consider where each of everything we touch comes from and how we will be sustained, how it will be reused, and how it will be disposed of. It is only then that we bring each of our UU principles into our homes, our offices, our communities, and then we can respect the interconnected web of all existence that we are a part. To live out our seventh principle. Moss is an ideal symbol of our seventh principle. When Kimmerer was asked, does Moss communicate, collaborate, wage war? She answered, plants certainly do communicate, primarily through the exchange of chemical signals. They inform one another of insect and pathogen attacks, which allows them to mount defenses. And there is evidence of collaboration as well as antagonism between plants. To my mind, plants meet any definition of intelligence. They have the ability to perceive, sense, respond to, and communicate about the environment. They create and maintain relationships with other beings. 
They adjust their behavior in ways that benefit survival and reproduction. How can we adjust our behavior like moss does? We too have the ability to perceive, to sense, to respond to the environment. We can create and maintain relationship with other beings, especially outside of our country, to learn new ways of being collaborative in living with Earth. We have to continue to commit to the three C's, commit to being more like moss. We've been accustomed to the convenience of disposable packaging and takeout containers made from non-renewable oil like styrofoam and plastic. I enjoy the comfort of year-round heating and air conditioning. Without it, would we even live in extreme climates like Florida and Wisconsin? As any recycler or organic shopper can tell you, it's almost always more expensive in time, money, or both to do the ecologically right thing. The key to successful capitalism is unlocking the desires of humans, convincing them that their comforts are actually needs. We are barraged with media everywhere from the gas pump to our phones and our pockets, convincing us to procure vast quantities of stuff, much of which will break or become obsolete. I often wonder if the decline in community-based religious institutions in our churches has been overtaken by the new religion of shopping. Yet again, if I look to Moss as my example of how to live, I see it adapting to new ways of living over and over again. It is dependent upon the environment around it to survive. Can we care enough about other living species on this earth to adapt to new ways of living? I wonder. Kimmer describes how mosses are not good competitors at all, and yet they are the oldest plants on the planet. They have persisted here for over 350 million years. 350 million years! They ought to be doing something right here, don't you think? What are they doing so right? One of those somethings, I think, has to do with their ability to cooperate and live in harmony with one another, to share the limited resources that they have to really give more than they take. Mosses build soil. They purify water. They are like the coral reefs of the forest. They make homes for this myriad of all these very cool little invertebrates who live there. They are just engines of biodiversity, Dr. Kimmerer tells us. They do all of these things and yet they're only one centimeter tall. A centimeter tall. Do you feel small in this quest to save our planet? I often do. And yet, moss is a centimeter high and it improves our earth in so many ways. Consider how tiny the moss are and how much might they have. When we talk about mighty moss, we are not talking about one thread of moss. We are talking about thousands and thousands of moss growing together. That is our hope. If we all work at consuming less, at changing laws, all work at sharing our resources and cleaning up our world, it is then that we will feel the magic of moss and the collective power of cooperation. Kimmer reminds us the realization that we are all beings on the same earth and that we all need the same things to flourish. Kinship also comes from our reciprocal relationship with other species. They are fulfilling their responsibility to us and we must fulfill our responsibility to them. 
Moss, the amphibians of vegetation, were among the first plants to emerge from the ocean and conquer the land. Mosses inhabit nearly every ecosystem on earth and grow in places as diverse as the branch of birch and the back of a beetle. Moss have survived not through competition, not through being the fittest, not by ruthless corporate takeovers or profiteering. Mosses survive by building their environment slowly. Kimmerer writes in her book, Gathering Moss, the rocks are beyond slow, beyond strong, and yet yielding to a soft green breath as powerful as a glacier, the mosses wearing their way down on surfaces, grain by grain, bringing them slowly back to sand. There is an ancient conservation going on between mosses and rocks that is poetry to be sure. Let us become part of that ancient conversation, creating poetry for our earth as luscious and luminous as moss. When you look at this world we are leaving to generations after us, consider the community you don't even know. Be as collaborative as carpet moss. Cooperate and adapt to your environment like apple moss. The mark you make could be as magnificent as millions of spores of moss. May you live in harmony. May you be like moss. This is a by Bobby Day. Fun fact about this song. Its copyright was never renewed, so it's in the public domain. It's as fun. garden or sidewalk or woods or beside any big body of water, know that you are loved. 
Seek justice, find peace.